Interim head coach Mickey Joseph says the Huskers get better day by day. You are Locked On Huskers, your daily podcast on the Nebraska Cornhuskers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Derek Pearson, DP, from 93.7 The Ticket in Lincoln, Nebraska. Appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with us and choosing Locked On Huskers as your first stop, first watch each and every single day, part of the Locked On Sports Network, and greatly appreciate you hanging out with us. Um, of course, this is brought to you by Bet Online. Folks from Bet Online have you covered the season uh, with more props, odds, and, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts day by day. This team is starting to represent some of the concepts and things that identify a culture. Uh, interim coach Mickey Joseph spoke to this this morning about the process and being able to work day by day to correct things that are wrong, to improve at areas where it is needed, and then to find the talent in those spaces. It's important for Mickey Joseph. Uh, to speak to this, because in a, in, a, in a situation where your team hasn't necessarily been confident, uh, where they didn't have the levels of success that uh, you would hope for, that they instill and install some of that belief in themselves. And winning two games uh, back-to-back certainly can help with that, but the reality is the mission and task repeats itself on a weekly basis. The good work is done. This team is on a win streak. But the word within the program and on the team is this, to go 1-0 this week, to go 1-0 each day at practice, to go 1-0 each day, uh, in each drill, uh, to go 1-0 with, the, with each opportunity. And if you don't, to learn so that you can do that next. Those, those things are important. Those ideas are, are important. Uh, and to hear those things in a regular and consistent uh, vacuum is important. That also comes from uh, offensive coordinator Mark Whipple in saying that we, on certain days, we don't operate at the level that I'm satisfied with. So I say so. I repeat that we must get better day by day and play by play. That is the mission and purpose behind all of this stuff. And it's good to hear uh, defensive coordinator Bill Bush talk about listen, we don't have excuses, we have missions. To understand that when the conversation changes in a space like this, good things can happen. And with a road win in the Big Ten on a Friday night where situation circumstance put them in some tough situations, they stepped up, they got better, they improved, they adjusted, they figured out uh, what changes need to be made, they figured out uh, what advantages they had, and they moved forward. And Friday night, I, I said that I thought they had stolen one on the road in Piscataway, New Jersey. But the truth was, is they earned one in Piscataway, New Jersey. On the road in a blackout on one of those event nights uh, in the Big Ten that are always difficult to play in. And the energy is a little bit different. And the emotions of being, uh, you know, 20-year-olds in that space, the emotions of having a fan base uh, that had a little bit more time on a Friday to celebrate and kind of get it going. Um, a different vibe in the building uh, on a Friday night. And, and quite frankly, the, the, as they announced it, the third most fans would ever been in the building. But I think what interim coach Mickey Joseph uh, came away with was we answered questions. I like to say this, and, 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 I, and I'll keep saying it. You can identify the level of a program by the number of questions that you have about it. And as Nebraska and this football program identifies answers, it becomes more competent. It becomes more prepared. It becomes more aware. Look, can this offensive team that roster depth chart that Nebraska is working from, can it win Big Ten games? The answer is yes. Can you throw the ball? Uh, at a high enough level and have enough talent to do so and be successful? The answer is yes. Can the run game be consistent and and effective enough to take some of the pressure off of Casey Thompson 
and this passing game? The answer is yes. Then there are still questions to be answered. What are the answers up front? What is the space of truth? What it, where is the win? When you line up Corcoran, Bando, Hickson, et cetera, when you go across the line, Hunter Anthony, um, you know, Ethan Piper, which one of them in a matchup has a win? Because you need to be able to have that thing in your hip pocket so that when you need and it's fourth and one and you need a win, where will you go and who will take you there? That front line and that offensive line has been a question mark. It remains a, 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 a question mark, and it will be so until, until they become consistent in their ability to move people in the Big Ten Conference. Matchups from, from week to week change. Rutgers front, front, front six, front seven is not the same as Purdue's. Different level of athletes, different level of experience, uh, different body masses, and different responsibilities in what Purdue asked their bigs up front to do versus what Rutgers will do. Change the line of scrimmage is how Rutgers approached Nebraska's offensive line. Maintain the line is what Purdue is going to offer to do. That is going to be the task. They are going to anchor down and simply try to be more solid and more foundationally structured than Nebraska uh, offensively. Nebraska has some weapons. They have, you know, look, you've got a 100-yard receiver, 100 yards per game uh, running back, 250 from your passing game. You've got all the boxes checked. Your captain's back. And probably the most important offensive feature and factor in Travis Vokola. Vokalek is a difference maker. He will be a difference maker Saturday. His ability to create chaos and duress for linebackers in the Big Ten is a way that Nebraska can be exceptional if they're willing to be patient and accept it. First play against Rutgers, passed to Vokalek. He took a hit on the ankle. He was stepped down the rest of the day. He took two more hits to those ankles. He finished the game, but he had to take some plays off and he had to do this. But when he is in the game and he's 100% uh, at health and very rarely is anybody, but Travis Vogelick against Purdue is a matchup that Casey Thompson, Mark Whipple, and this offense can take advantage of in full. In full. Uh, We'll take a break. I want you to understand that You can help us in bringing this content to you. So we want you to like, subscribe, share, and get the alerts. Uh, You can also leave comments in the the comment section. Let us know what you think about uh, the podcast and what you want want, want me to talk about. I'm open to it. I'm open to it. But please like, subscribe, share, and hit the alert. Uh, Bet online, uh, the most props and odds have Purdue as a 13 and a half point favorite. The over and under is 56 and a half. I give you no suggestions on what to do with that. I'm only letting you know that Purdue walks in this thing. This is a prohibitive favorite on the road for the Huskers. Defensively, the Huskers have some challenges. Any team in the Big Ten that has a quality tight end is a problem for Big Ten defenses because of their aggressiveness. You cannot be passive in how you uh, defend a quality tight end. Purdue has three. They will run singles, they'll run doubles, they'll run triples. And they just simply flood. When you're into a three-backer set or a two-backer set, they're going to put somebody under duress. This is a big game for the safeties of Nebraska. Because they're going to have to fill in and cover for their linebacker brothers at the highest level they've been asked all season long. The three tight end set, look, Purdue, they've got quality receivers. Jones is a quality receiver. I believe he's got 50 catches so far. Quality. He and O'Connell have been buddies since high school. They know each other. They know how they think. They know how to get in space. They do all those things. 
But it's the three tight ends that worry and concern me. They get to the second level, and then they force the safety to come downhill, which puts single outside, and then you've got work to do. A way to make Adrian O'Connell uncomfortable is to get in his face, hands in his face. The phrase you want, I want you to, to, to focus on is a dirty window. And I want to see the big paws of Caleb Tanner. I want to see the big paws of O'Shawn Mathis and Garrett Nelson, Ty Robinson. I need them in the face of O'Connell. He doesn't like it. Teams have often tried to pressure him from the outside in. He's not affected by that. He's not bothered by that because his step-up game is good. But what you want to do in that space is to make sure that those easy passing windows directly in front of, of, of O'Connell are dirty. Batted balls will be a part of it. Tip drills in full effect. They're not the fastest tight ends. They're pretty consistent. They're pretty consistent in what they do. Up front for Nebraska, look, Colton Feast and Ty Robinson had their best games individually and collectively last Friday night. Feast was exceptional. Uh, they freed him up and let him be independent. Uh, Ty Robinson, they let him loose. As he said, he unleashed the beast, and he got to be a big man out there throwing people around. And what that allowed to happen outside was O'Shawn Mathis got to run and set, 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 set a proper boundary. Caleb Tanner got to rotate and move around the field and be in different places in different spaces. But affected most was the way it allowed Garrett Nelson to attack Rutgers' uh, offensive tackles. It allowed him the freedom to be more athletic, more gifted. His power moves worked. His swim moves worked. Everything worked. He had his best day with 11 and a half tackles, one and a half sacks. Look, defensively, Nebraska has every piece in play to be successful against Purdue Saturday. A couple of things in play. Luke Reimers, it will be day-to-day. -day. He'll make he may, he'll make the trip. He'll make the travel squad, so he'll have the opportunity and they will have a game-time decision on how he's doing. But know this, that when you're limited in the number of players you take, if you're taking somebody, you expect them to play. <laughs> There's not enough empty bodies out there for you just to take folks for the trip. So if he's going, if Reimers is going, you expect him to play. If you get he and Heinrich together over the course of this thing, again, their experience, their ability to communicate, wonderful. Puts you in a better opportunity. I, Me personally, I would take away the passing game and make Purdue beat me on the ground. They're at their third and fourth running backs. Look, they, they're quality, but – if I'm going to lose to Purdue, it's going to be in the run game. I'm not going to allow the pass game to beat me. I can trust Mathis and, 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 and Nelson to get home one time and to create some havoc. They've got a couple of 250-yard rushers. Uh, both have four touchdowns. But th this is not the star factor that, we, that we, we, we're, we're talking about. The key to this matchup, to me, it's, it's, it's Heinrich and, and Reimers versus O'Connell. They have to be in his head. They have to be in his thinking. They have to be in his reads. They have to be in the window of the throws that he wants to make. Whoever becomes more successful in this matchup has the advantage. O'Connell is in probably what appears to be his like 900th Big Ten game. He's been around forever, and that, you know, this shows up on game time. But he's really good in the system. Look, from a creative standpoint, what Jeff Brown does with this offense and his route combinations is top level. He has better schemes than he has talented players on his team. What he draws up, he's a mad scientist in the lab. And listen, if O'Connell is patient, there's always somebody open in this offense. When O'Connell is successful, he's taking the layup, which is the dump to the running back. And if you see that nine or ten times in the game, he's getting what he wants to get. If he's not checking down, he's going to make mistakes. That's when tip drill happens. That's when 
he holds it a little bit longer than he wants and gets pressure, maybe a strip sack along the way. Um, he throws into a lot of hands uh, in the middle of, 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 of pressure. His step-up game is good. But I hope Robinson you know, and company just stay home. Don't be cute. Cute gets you beat. Stay home. Stay in the window. Be active in it. And allow those, those deer chasers on the outside to get home. When you talk about all the other things that are in play for this thing, um, <laughs> to say that Purdue's special teams aren't good would be very kind of me. They're not very good on special teams. Not good at very net punt. The punt nets aren't good. The return you know, yards aren't great. Um, the personnel on, on the field aren't great. For the first time this season, I can honestly and openly say that I believe Nebraska has an advantage on special teams. This is where you hope that Nebraska special team steps up, steps up and you get a big play. I know I'm a dreamer, but this would be a wonderful day for a punt return. This would be a wonderful opportunity. They don't put their best players on the field for special teams. And if you can get a Trey Palmer and such back there and they can put their foot in the ground, something magical can happen. I also would not be surprised if they took a chance to put on a couple of punt box. We haven't seen much of Nebraska's place kicking yet. One for three. That's that's in six games. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody else in the country has a number like that. But it'll come up on Saturday. I have a feeling, a sneaky suspicion that the outcome of the game may rest on the leg of Nebraska's kickers. One to flip the field and second to put points on the board with opportunities. Here are the boxes that we know to check when it comes to Nebraska football in this version. Penalties. Keep those under six. Under six. And big fatal penalties. Holding after you acquire after you, you, you obtain a first down. Personal foul in space. Things that you can control. Late hits. You don't want those. Being aggressive is not the same as being over aggressive. Holding penalties. Listen, got to figure out a way to protect Casey Thompson and then not do extra damage to the team. It's one thing for your quarterback to take the hit. It's another for you, him to take the hit and you, you lose yardage or you lose the first down based on. Turnovers, keeping track of the ball. Listen, I, I, a 30-plus rushing attempt game wouldn't be a bad idea in West Lafayette. It would be, because if you're doing that, you're going to tee up uh, Marcus Washington and Trey Palmer to have big nights. Bring those safeties into the box so you can throw above corners. I don't ask for much. I just want 100 yards for Trey Palmer and another 100. Yeah, let's go 75 for Marcus Washington just because. 75 for Vocalic, another 40 for Grant. I'm not asking for much. Sorry, I'm not. I'd like a clean game. No turnovers. Penalties sometimes, you know, fall in space. But you can control killing possessions. Like you want a kick to end every possession, whether it's an extra point, a field goal, or a punt. No short fields for the veteran quarterback in O'Connell. Make Jeff Brom go into his second-level playbook, which is where he has to get super creative. Make him get to that. If Brahm is beating Nebraska with straight-ahead dives and, and slant routes, it's going to be a long night in West Lafayette. Take away those and make this Purdue team – I'm going to say this as simple as I can say it. I'm going to make Purdue play on the outer thirds. It has to be because I want longer throws for, for O'Connell. I want offensive linemen to have to play longer, and I want playmakers to have to make plays in space. 
but I do not want them to get into a rhythm. I do not want them to have consistency up the middle. I don't want them moving the chains without taking any risk. Take away the middle of the field, and after that, you have the opportunity to run some stunts and run some tricks. It's much easier to defend the middle third of the field rather than the entire, uh, the entire field. If Nebraska controls the middle of the field, Jeff Brom has to go back into the next level of his playbook because a lot of his stuff is route combinations flooding in the middle of the field, mesh concepts, et cetera. Make him make o, make O'Connell turn to the sideline and throw. Simplifies your day. Let's hope that the coaching staff has the type of, of, of night that it had in the second half at Rutgers that they get on the same page on how they want to attack offenses, how they want the defenses to play, what personnel they put on the field. And then finally, come to some agreement about the culture and identity of this team. What is its best play? Who is its best player? How do you get your best player the ball in space the most times? And how do you keep Purdue? from getting the ball in Jones's hands or get it out of O'Connell's hands before he's ready for it to happen. There's lots in play. This is a big ball game for a three and three Nebraska team. This could set this Husker nation on fire. It could change the conversation. It could change the thinking. It could change the direction, location, elevation of this team. And then Turn Nebraska back into a football program. Currently, this is a team that's fighting. What we hope is after Saturday, the program is back. If you like what you heard, like what you saw, give me a like, subscribe, share, get the alerts. Again, I'm DP. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for allowing Lockdown Huskers to be your first stop, first watch of each day, each and every single day. And thanks for being a part of the Locked On Sports Network.